on a secluded corner of a U.S. military depot in rural Alabama, stands a gray blockhouse structure, imposing if only for its anonymity. But behind these walls of reinforced concrete exists an enterprise like no other in the Department of Defense. This climate-controlled facility belongs to the center of military history. It is, in fact, the official attic of the United States Army. An attic filled with 200 years of history, 100,000 artifacts, uniforms, flags, artillery, tanks, jeeps, and 17,000 fully operational guns. Our purpose is to ship, store, and receive weapons for the Army Museum system. These are fully operable weapons, so every time we open a box to pull weapons for shipment, they're, it's inventoried before it's put back on the shelf. These ordinary wooden crates hold extraordinary contents. Thompson submachine guns. 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine guns, 45 caliber pistols. Some of these weapons from World War II are in mint condition, still in the original factory boxes. The center of military history demands accuracy. Ensuring that the correct model of gun is used in a particular display is of vital importance to what goes on here. These weapons are laid out going to various museums in the field and we go through these weapons and ensure that they get the proper type for the time period portrayed and in some cases they may cover several war periods. These are M1 carbines that were used through World War II, Korea and Vietnam. The earlier model had the flip sight and the flat bolt uh, both models would have seen service in subsequent wars, but only the one with the flip sight would be accurate for World War II. Even though they are the same stock number and would be issued uh, indiscriminately, they are very different for our purposes. Though these guns are silent now, they remain a palpable link to that not-too-distant past when brave men carried them into battle and changed the world forever. But to understand the weapons, one must first understand the infantry itself. Prior to entering World War II, the United States Army adopted a concept of offense based on fire and maneuver, relying on the knockdown power of the 30 caliber weapons then in use. At its most basic level, fire and maneuver meant that the enemy would be fired upon or fixed by one group then maneuvered against and destroyed by a second. Army organization revolved around this concept. The basic infantry rifle company comprised 187 soldiers and six officers. It was organized into four platoons. Three were rifle platoons, which had three squads each. The fourth was a weapons platoon, which provided the heavy firepower. Typically, three machine guns, three mortars, and three bazookas. As the rifle platoons moved forward, the weapons platoon would move in close support and then would be directed by the company commander to the sector where additional firepower was needed the most. Another way they are often used is they were divided up, again with the organization of three. Each platoon might get a machine gun, a mortar, or a bazooka. But the key thing that the riflemen looked for was once they had located the enemy and fixed him, that additional support was readily available from these heavier weapons. You get as close as you can without getting hit. Uh, you had to draw them off. You'd draw the fire one way and somebody else would come in another way. Close contact to them as close as you could. And you had to worm your way up to it. The rifle and weapons platoons 36 men each were called Alpha Bravo teams. Throughout the war, 
it was these men who would carry the ultimate burden of closing with and destroying the enemy. The rifle has long been the traditional weapon of the infantrymen. The adoption of fire and maneuver tactics induced a transition from bolt action to semi-automatic rifles. Although the M1 Garand would become the standard rifle of the U.S. Army during the war, initially they were in short supply. Thousands of older model rifles remained in use, such as the U.S. rifle caliber 30 M1903, commonly known as the Springfield. The design was licensed from the Mauser Company of Germany after the Spanish-American War for approximately $200,000. This is a 1903 Springfield, which was the standard U.S. Army rifle in the interwar years. Uh, the Springfield is a bolt action, turn bolt operated, magazine fed, infantry rifle, has about a 26 inch barrel. The sights on this rifle were, were horrible. It has a little notch rear sight. For long range work, the sights raised. It's adjusted by turning this screw and moving it up and down. There's, a, there's an aperture for that work. It's fine for range work on, in, in pr precision shooting on the range. But in combat, your targets are very fast moving, and you have to be to, able to very quickly acquire them, take aim, and then shoot. Because of the shortage of combat rifles early in the war, production of the Model 1903, or 0-3, as it was called, was reactivated. When the Marines landed on Guadalcanal in 1942, most were armed with Springfields. Nearly two years later, on June 6, 1944, Spec 5 Harry Davis stormed ashore at Normandy with the 5th Ranger Infantry Battalion. As a Ranger, Davis had been trained to use every type of small arm found in the European theater. But he had a particular fondness for the O3A4. I was the company commander's bodyguard and company sniper. Uh, wherever he went, I went. The O3 was a sniper weapon that I used to hit targets that were far away and with precision. And uh, they were very, very accurate guns. It's more accurate uh, because of a rigid construction. There is no moving parts when the gun is fired other than the firing pin. The 1903A4 was equipped with a telescopic sight, was issued primarily to snipers for very accurate fire at 800 to 1,000 yards. Harry Davis once employed his sniper skills to deal with German harassment from across no man's land. There was a gully between this and that, maybe about 200 yards. Uh, and there was a well there. And when we went to the well, it creaked. And every time somebody went to the well to get water, this German would fire on it and hit somebody. And I made my mind up I was going to get the guy that's doing it or repay them back. I laid there for about four or five hours, and I saw somebody come out with a white shirt, a T-shirt, and hang his clothes on a line, a white shirt, or a white T-shirt again. And I laid there and I zeroed in with my O3 rifle. And I measured it and measured it and measured it. And lo and behold, he came out to get his shirt off the line and I fired. We didn't have any problems with the well anymore. The Springfield remained in service as a sniper weapon throughout the war. But the next generation infantry rifle was already in production. In 1937, after a decade of development, the U.S. Army had officially accepted the gas-operated, semi-automatic, caliber 30 M1, designed by John Garand. John Cantius Garand was a, actually Canadian, and he was a classic, what the British would refer to as eccentric. He kept an ice skating rink in the living room of his home and would go ice skate in, in his house. But the man was a genius. Probably the most successful rifle of all time in terms of actual troop use in combat was the M1 Garand. Garand's genius was such that he overcame every obstacle that was placed in his way. The rifle was reliable under virtually every environment into which it was subjected. Uh, 
I've talked to some World War II veterans uh, from the Battle of the Bulls and Hurricane Forest when the rifle was frozen literally, and they made the rifle go again by just urinating on it, and it was fine after that. The M1 fired an eight round clip. A trained rifleman could empty it within 20 seconds with unparalleled accuracy for such a high rate of fire. The reason for that was because of the gas system of the M1. The gas system caused the recoil to be softened, and as a consequence of that, it lessened muzzle rise. The rifleman was able to get his follow up shots off much more quickly than he could with a bolt action gun. For one thing, with a bolt action gun, between each shot, you're having to work that bolt. You have to get your, get your face up out of the way, you lose your sight picture, you lose your position. But in the end, a weapon was only as effective as the man who carried it. Transforming a nation of farmers and accountants, factory workers and bus drivers into soldiers was a daunting challenge. For many young men, like Bill Reynas from Los Angeles, California, the Garand was the first rifle they had ever held, let alone fired. The Marine Corps has one particular way of training you to fire. The four basic positions was the prone, the kneeling, the sitting, and the standing. And we would go through these four positions over and over and over. But hours spent on the rifle range did not necessarily translate into combat effectiveness. Sometimes, stateside procedures had to be untaught in the war zone. One of the important aspects of American training, which was criticized during and after the war, was the way that infantrymen were trained with their basic weapons. That training environment had very little to do with what the soldier faced in actual combat. In combat, there was the noise and confusion of the battlefield, terrible weather conditions, all kinds of obstructions, and the enemy made it their business not to be seen on the battlefield. The American soldier had a tendency not to shoot at something he could not see. His trainers in the States told him this was a waste of ammunition. When soldiers got in battle, the veterans told them the exact opposite. Get your weapon out. We know the enemy is in a certain location, and we as a squad, as a platoon or a company, need to generate a volume of fire against this objective that will allow us to maneuver against it. So don't worry about whether you can see the enemy or not. And they told their soldiers, we can always get more ammunition. We may not be able to get more rifles. Whatever the shortcomings of stateside training, in combat, the Garand M1 rifle was the consummate integration of technology and tactics. No less an authority than General George S. Patton III called the M1 the greatest battle implement ever devised. It was a sentiment endorsed by the millions of infantrymen who carried it into combat. The submachine gun although used by the Germans in World War I in limited numbers, came to prominence as a combat weapon in the next great war. Using small caliber pistol ammunition, the submachine gun combined the machine gun's high volume of fire with the mobility of the rifle at the expense of range and accuracy. At the end of World War I, the U.S. Army showed little interest in pursuing the concept. It fell to one man, retired Army General John T. Thompson, to develop and promote the trench broom gun for close combat. Thompson later changed the name to submachine gun, which meant any small automatic firing weapon chambered for the 45 caliber automatic Colt pistol, or ACP. The Tommy gun, as it became known, first sold in quantity to the civilian market as the Model 1921. It gained notoriety during the Prohibition era as the preferred weapon of the mob. The Thompson's early association with the gangster element poisoned relations with the military. Finally, in 1927, 
the U.S. Marines obtained several hundred of the weapons and used them to good effect in the jungles of Nicaragua, subduing Sandino guerrillas. The Navy Department officially adopted a modified Thompson submachine gun in 1928. The rate of fire was reduced from 800 to 600 rounds per minute. The cuts compensator, which lessened muzzle climb by deflecting the blast, was standardized. This is the model 1928 Thompson submachine gun. It's a full automatic 45 caliber weapon. Uh, this particular model has the cuts compensator, can fire the 50 round drum magazine or 30 round box magazine, and has a multi-piece bolt. The sights on the weapon are very intricate and be used minutely. These were first purchased by the post office and later used by the Marine Corps in the Caribbean. With Europe on the brink of war, the U.S. Army finally placed an order for over 20,000 guns. It became abundantly clear that we needed submachine guns. And the only thing we had was the Thompson. Uh, the Thompson was a very complicated submachine gun to manufacture. The Thompson was redesigned in 1941 to simplify production and reduce costs. The following year, it was standardized as the M1 submachine gun. The later model M1 and M1A1 don't have the cuts compensator, fire only from the box magazine, and have a very simplistic sheet metal sight. These weapons were about $350 to produce during World War II. A Thompson submachine gun isn't something that you hold up like an M1 and sight through and squeeze off around. It lays down a volume of fire. And when you get up and you want to move out, you want a volume laid down, a spraying effect that's going to keep the enemy's head down while you get up and go. Thompsons were carefully allocated to squad leaders and NCOs, except in Ranger battalions. Anybody could have a Thompson that could use it. And if a squad leader went down, he picked it up, it was his weapon. And uh, submachine guns were anybody's weapon at that time. We were attached to the 29th Infantry Division, and we spearheaded anything they ran into trouble with. If they hit sniper fire out of trees, rangers up front. Rangers had to come in and rake the trees and knock the sniper out. Or if they ran into a difficulty going into a little town, a house or a pillbox, rangers up front. In the Pacific Theater, there never were enough Thompsons to go around, at least for the Marines. The Thompson submachine gun was probably the most prized weapon in the infantry. Uh, it wasn't issued, uh, and those that had them, we never asked how they came by them to get them. Although heavy, expensive, and complex to manufacture, the Tommy gun had one great overriding virtue, its reliability. By 1945, over one and a quarter million had been produced. Nevertheless, the Army began looking for a less expensive alternative to the Thompson as early as 1941. Even when it was simplified for, for mass production, the Thompson was still horribly complicated to, to manufacture. It required a lot of machining, was very expensive, and we needed submachine guns. In October 1942, the U.S. Army began development of a stamped sheet metal submachine gun based on the British Sten design. Within two months, the Army had formally adopted the submachine gun, caliber 45 M3. It was immediately nicknamed the Grease Gun because of its resemblance to that particular garage implement. This is the 45 caliber submachine gun M3. It's made out of mostly stamped and welded parts. Could be made very cheaply. The safety is a small metal tab that fits into a hole in the bolt that keeps the cocking lever from moving. These cost about $15 to produce during World War II. The Army contracted with the Guide Lamp Division of General Motors, which had a lot of experience making stamped headlight housings for cars. M3 production was underway, 
by the summer of 1943. The most complicated machining part of it is the bolt, which is very heavy, works on, on two recoil springs and straight blowback, and it fires at a rate of about 400 rounds a minute, 45 automatic caliber, simplicity itself. In 1944, the M3 was modified to allow for even greater ease of production and use in the field. This new grease gun was adopted in December 1944 as the submachine gun caliber 45 M3A1. This is the M3A1 submachine gun, new in the box. It contains the magazines wrapped in foil paper and the barrel wrapped in foil paper, the original packaging of the weapon from the factory. A particularly ingenious feature of the M3 series was a provision of a kit to convert the weapon from standard 45 caliber to German 9mm ammunition. By the end of the war, Guidelamp had made over 600,000 grease guns and it was replacing the venerable Thompson in ever-increasing numbers. The introduction of the M3 and M3A1 submachine guns marked the passing of an era in military small arms. An age of carefully crafted weapons with finely milled metal parts and hand-rubbed wood. In the evolving technology of warfare, the lowly grease gun stands as a significant achievement. Between the world wars, the machine gun evolved from essentially a static piece of miniature artillery to a lightweight, pivotal infantry weapon. One that could be carried forward in battle to dramatically increase the volume of fire. Anytime you're engaged with a machine gun, it tends to get your attention, though. And, and you, you can always tell which direction the bullets are coming from. One man, John Moses Browning, was responsible for essentially all machine guns used by American infantry troops in World War II. Years earlier, the Army had accepted the Browning machine rifle model 1918. The BAR, as it became known, entered production too late to be a factor in World War I. But the U.S. Army used it as the squad-level automatic weapon well into the 1950s. This is a Browning automatic rifle, a 30 caliber light machine gun, brand new in the box. It was produced by Northeast Small Arms Company and has never been issued. It has provisions for mounting a bipod and the shoulder stock flips up so that it can be rested on the shoulder. The only material differences between the World War I and the World War II weapons were the bipod and the, the shoulder stock. Uh, both what weapons saw service in World War II. The Browning automatic rifle was designed originally as an individual weapon, but it was so heavy, 20 pounds, that it became used in as what's called today a squad automatic weapon or a light machine gun. The BAR was beautifully crafted with a massive receiver machined from a solid block of steel. It could be fired from the shoulder or hip, or after 1937, from a prone position using an attached bipod. While in training, Marine PFC Bill Reynas became a designated BAR man because the flamethrower he was originally assigned to operate made him nauseous. We were using 100 octane gasoline mixed with diesel oil. And uh, when I would fire it, it burned away all the oxygen, and I'd take a big breath, and it just made me deathly ill. In giving up the flamethrower, I agreed to take the BAR, and a uh, wonderful weapon, and I never regret doing it. The BAR had a lot of knockdown power. It was meant to make the bad guy put their heads down while the other parts of the squad maneuvered against them. It uh, would fire 20 rounds, where your M1 was only 8 rounds. And we learned very quickly that the best way to fire it was one man would fire, and while he reloaded the magazine, the other BAR man would take up the fire, 
and do it in threes. In that manner, you are laying down a constant field of fire and uh, not waiting to reload and, and letting up the fire that was coming down. Most impressive was the BAR's superior power and penetration ability, particularly when paired with 30 caliber armor-piercing ammunition, or AP. In fact, in both the European and Pacific theaters, AP was used virtually to the exclusion of ball ammo, the traditional anti-personnel round. This made the BAR even more deadly. It was firepower. It was good firepower. You felt safe with a BAR man in your squad, because he really was like a, a miniature 88. Another Browning-designed weapon would become the infantry's heavy machine gun in World War II. With a combined gun and tripod weight in excess of 93 pounds, not counting accessories, the 1917 A1 was indeed a heavy and cumbersome weapon. Once in position, it tended to remain fixed. A condenser box was used to prevent steam from the water jacket surrounding the gun barrel from giving away its position. A sustained rate of fire of 450 to 600 rounds per minute compensated somewhat for its lack of mobility. From fixed defensive positions, the 1917 A1 Browning was unsurpassed for laying down fields of interlacing fire for maximum effect. It's not just willy-nilly. They can move, elevate, and traverse, that is, bring the weapon up or down, and traverse it left or right to very precisely adjust what's called the beaten zone, that is, where the bullets fall, of the machine gun. And a good gunner can adjust it uh, vertically, horizontally, or even laterally to, to get a beaten zone exactly where he wants it. The 1917 Browning came to symbolize the machine gun in World War II, if for no other reason than the public had become familiar with its impressive silhouette. No less a master than Norman Rockwell immortalized the weapon in a 1942 poster for the War Department, the only combat painting the artist made during his long career. The stark, arresting image depicts an anonymous machine gunner who could be any mother's son, holding off an unseen enemy. He is about to run out of ammunition. The caption reads, let's give him enough and on time. It is classic Rockwell, at once poignant and powerful. Despite the M1917's legendary reputation, lack of maneuverability remained a drawback. Lightweight machine guns were needed to provide cover to advancing rifle companies. Thus, the air-cooled M1919A4 was born. The gun and its tripod together weighed approximately 45 pounds, half that of the water-cooled M1917. While neither is steady nor offering the sustained rate of fire, the M1919A4 was much easier to set up and provided a low profile for concealability. This configuration is the 1919A4 E1, which is used in tanks as a coaxial machine gun. The cocking handle is to the rear to allow cocking in the confines of a tank. And this is the 1919A6 machine gun, which features a bipod and a shoulder stock and is more portable than the 1919A4. Covering fire from 30 caliber Brownings allowed Bill Reynes and his Marine squad to move forward over the black volcanic sand of Iwo Jima in February 1945. The machine guns were great. You know, we were wonderful to give us support to move up and then we could hold the line while they moved up and took on new positions. The air-cooled seemed to be the one, the best weapon. It was light, it was mobile, it was easy to carry. Three men would operate a gun at a gunner, assistant gunner, and an ammo carrier. 
So the three would, would operate a gun very easily. By and large, the machine guns employed by all sides during World War II were chambered for 30 caliber rifle ammunition, or its equivalent. The United States, however, also fielded the heavy Browning 50 caliber machine gun. John Browning, again, essentially scaled up the 1917 and designed what became known as the M2 uh, machine gun. Short of cannon fire, the brutal impact of the M2's big bullet was without equal during the war. The 50 caliber bullet primarily is an anti-material weapon. It'll take down walls, it'll take down light armored vehicles, uh, it'll take down aircraft. It's, it's, it's just a very, very potent weapon. The M2 was and remains the most widely used of Browning's machine guns. It was placed on tanks and half tracks. Army and Navy fighter planes used them as offensive armament. While B-17 and B-24 bombers carried as many as 12 M2s for defense against enemy fighters. We used to call it Modus, yeah, M2. Modus because Modus got everybody's respect. And there's not much arguing with Modus either. When the M2 machine gun was introduced, the standard service rifle in the United States was the M1903 Springfield. We've gone through the M1, the M1 Garand, the M14, and now we're into the M16. And the M2 is going to be around for a lot longer. During the Second World War, the Axis armies issued sidearms primarily as badges of rank for officers. The Americans, on the other hand, had always viewed pistols as legitimate weapons, expected to meet the same standards of rugged utility as any other military issue firearm. The Colt 45 automatic triumphed in that role, performing brilliantly in two world wars and qualifying in the process as the finest combat handgun in the world. Officially known as the Model 1911, the Colt 45 had its origins in the continuing campaign of pacification in the southern Philippine Islands, ongoing since the end of the Spanish-American War. The inadequacies of the 45's predecessor, the Model 1892 Colt Revolver, were shockingly demonstrated by the capacity of charging Moro tribesmen to withstand volley after volley of 38 caliber fire. The army decided that it needed a new pistol and since the semi-automatic was starting to come around, John Browning had just designed a new uh, semi-automatic pistol. This was the Colt Model 1905. The army tried these and had a few shortcomings. And the 1905 was essentially the direct predecessor of the 1911. Browning and the Colt Firearms Company continued development on the new design. It was accepted by the Army as Pistol Automatic Caliber 45 Model 1911. Experience derived in World War I resulted in some minor changes to the shape of the gun being adopted in 1922, including shortening the trigger and changing the contour of the grip. With these modifications, the 45 Colt Automatic became the M1911A1 and remained the standard U.S. sidearm until 1983. This is a World War II production, uh, 1911A1. It has the arch mainspring housing, which was changed from flat in 1922. It has the extended spur here on the grip safety to keep your hand from being bitten by the hammer as it came back. And it has the cutout here on the side of the frame to, uh, to enable you to do to better reach, reach rounding and grasp, grasp the trigger. Other than that, the gun is pretty much the same as it was back in, uh, back in 1911 when it was originally introduced. The Model 1911 saw widespread service in every theater of conflict. Although sometimes criticized for being too heavy and inaccurate, the 45 stopping power was undeniable. The pistol is as accurate as the person who's shooting it. A lot of the, the inaccuracy stories came from the 60s, 
when the 45 pistols that were then in service with the, with the U.S. military had been around since World War II and were basically worn out. It's an accurate weapon if you use it right. One of the most important things in combat firing is the correct grip on the gun stock. The way you're supposed to fire a 45 is not just draw it like from the hip and shoot it because it has an awful kick and you come down on your target with a 45 and you can't miss. Forty fives were issued to officers and sergeants, machine gun crews, tank crews, anyone whose primary job prevented him from carrying a rifle. But pistols of all kinds were sought after by everyone. I've been told that the chaplains even carried a 45. Everybody cherished a pistol. Everybody wanted a pistol, and they rode home for pistols. But pistols were, were great. We had a uh, 38 caliber Smith & Wesson that was carried by our uh, guide sergeant in my platoon, and it was passed down through eight or ten men. As one would get hit, wounded, or would be killed, it would come down to somebody else. And uh, that went through ten hands before the campaign was over. The value of that pistol uh, came to light at night when you were dug in to be able to lay there and feel the security of that pistol in your hand that if somebody climbed up to your hole and tried to get in, you had something that you very quickly could defend yourself with. The blitzkrieg tactics used by the Germans early in the war demonstrated that Allied rear echelon personnel could be exposed to enemy action. What was needed, the argument went, was something other than 45s to arm support troops. In June 1940, the Army issued specifications for a light rifle that could take the place of both the 45 pistol and the submachine gun. In September 1941, it was announced that the Winchester Repeating Arms Company of New Haven, Connecticut had won the design competition. The Army adopted the new weapon as Carbine Caliber 30 M1. The M1 carbine was designed to issue to people who don't shoot for a living, uh, cooks, clerks, mechanics, officers, NCOs, and it was designed to replace a pistol rather than a rifle. And it served through World War II, Korea, and it was still in service during the Vietnam War. The carbine's compactness earned it early favor, but in combat, the small 30 caliber round lacked the knockdown power of either the 30 odd six at distance or the 45 at close range. Despite the ambivalence surrounding the carbine's effectiveness, over six million were produced by the end of the war. No less than 10 manufacturing plants as diverse as Winchester, IBM, General Motors, National Postal Meter, and the Rockola Jukebox Corporation churn them out. The most of any World War II personal weapon. But ultimately, the tale of this gun and all others that served the infantry cannot be recounted without considering the most vital component of any weapon, the soldier. For no matter how great the weapon, it was just so much junk unless the infantrymen resisting every impulse to the contrary, returned fire. You can pinpoint the guys in your mind that were aggressive, that led the way. That's why they say lead the way rangers. There were certain people that led the way, and you followed. Our company commander, our lieutenants, the squad leaders, whoever were there in charge led the way, and we followed. And that's why we were rangers because we had the balls to do what they did. For three months, Harry Davis, the ranger who came ashore at Omaha Beach, fought mile by mile to enlarge the tenuous foothold the Allies had established on Fortress Europe. On September 15, 1944, his 101st day in combat, Davis was grievously wounded by a German mortar shell. His wife in Philadelphia mistakenly received a telegram that her husband had been killed in action. Weeks passed before she learned that he was alive. 
Five months later, on the other side of the world, the 2nd Battalion of the 28th Marine Regiment was about to rendezvous with history on the island of Iwo Jima. This was my first combat, and I had to pick one of the biggest. You know, we all lived with fear. There was no question about that. You know, to have these close friends that you had been with for over a year, just all of a sudden they're gone. They're no longer with you. They're dead. And to be able to shift that off and clear your mind of it and know that the objective was at the end and you had to keep going. You didn't have a choice. It was just keep going. The fighting on Iwo Jima was supposed to be over in 72 hours. The Japanese held out for 37 days. 7,000 Marines died on eight square miles of volcanic rock and sand. One of every three Americans who fought there was killed or wounded. On February 23rd, five days into the battle, Reynos's first squad was ordered to take a large American flag to the summit of Mount Suribachi, which had just been wrested from the Japanese after heavy fighting. The order came just as Reynos, ever the conscientious Marine, had disassembled his BAR for cleaning. As his squad left without him and moved up the mountain, Reynos had no idea that six of his buddies were about to be immortalized in the image that has come to symbolize victory in the Second World War. On the 2nd of March, 1945, Nine days after the flag raising on Mount Suribachi, PFC Bill Reynos was hit in the chest by mortar shrapnel. Of the original 10 men in his squad, only one, Ira Hayes, made it through the entire campaign unscathed. And Ira Hayes, a quiet Pima Indian from Arizona, is captured forever, reaching into the sky at the Marine Corps Memorial in Arlington, Virginia. That's one of the most outstanding things in our capital, is to be able to go there and stand and look up at that beautiful bronze statue and see it. But it's hard for me to stand there and look at it without thinking of Mike Strank, Frank Sousley, Harlan Block, Ira Hayes, John Bradley, because I was so close to them. All six of those men are gone now. The American infantryman in World War II fought with a great confidence that he had the entire backing of the arsenal of democracy. He saw huge air armadas overflying him on the way to Berlin to pound the enemy's homeland. He knew a tremendous logistical force was in place to support him. He knew that a great American Navy controlled the Atlantic and Pacific. But despite all that, the infantryman realized that the ultimate job of closing with the enemy and destroying them and getting to Berlin and to Tokyo ultimately fell on his back. And the fact that they did this with the weapons that they were provided, the tactics in which they had trained, and that they did this despite taking very heavy casualties is a great tribute to the American fighting man. On a secluded corner of a U.S. military depot in rural Alabama stands a gray blockhouse structure, imposing if only for its anonymity. But behind these walls of reinforced concrete exists an enterprise like no other in the Department of Defense. This climate-controlled facility belongs to the center of military history. It is, in fact, the official attic of the United States Army. An attic filled with 200 years of history, 100,000 artifacts, uniforms, flags, artillery, tanks, jeeps, and 17,000 fully operational guns.
Our purpose is to ship, store, and receive weapons for the Army Museum system. These are fully operable weapons, so every time we open a box to pull weapons for shipment, they're, it's inventory before it's put back on the shelf. These ordinary wooden crates hold extraordinary contents. Thompson submachine guns, 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine guns, 45 caliber pistols. Some of these weapons from World War II are in mint condition, still in the original factory boxes. The center of military history demands accuracy. Ensuring that the correct model of gun is used in a particular display is of vital importance to what goes on here. These weapons are laid out going to various museums in the field and we go through these weapons and ensure that they get the proper type for the time period portrayed and in some cases they may cover several war periods. These are M1 carbines that were used through World War II, Korea and Vietnam. The earlier model had the flip sight and the flat bolt. Uh, both models would have seen service in subsequent wars, but only the one with the flip sight would be accurate for World War II. Even though they are the same stock number and would be issued uh, indiscriminately, they are very different for our purposes. Though these guns are silent now, they remain a palpable link to that not-too-distant past when brave men carried them into battle and changed the world forever. But to understand the weapons, one must first understand the infantry itself. Prior to entering World War II, the United States Army adopted a concept of offense based on fire and maneuver, relying on the knockdown power of the 30 caliber weapons then in use. At its most basic level, fire and maneuver meant that the enemy would be fired upon or fixed by one group, then maneuvered against and destroyed by a second. Army organization revolved around this concept. The basic infantry rifle company comprised 187 soldiers and six officers. It was organized into four platoons. Three were rifle platoons, which had three squads each. The fourth was a weapons platoon, which provided the heavy firepower. Typically, three machine guns, three mortars, and three bazookas. As the rifle platoons moved forward, the weapons platoon would move in close support and then would be directed by the company commander to the sector where additional firepower was needed the most. Another way they are often used is they were divided up, again with the organization of three. Each platoon might get a machine gun, a mortar, or a bazooka. But the key thing that the riflemen looked for was once they had located the enemy and fixed him, that additional support was readily available from these heavier weapons. You get as close as you can without getting hit. Uh, you had to draw them off, you'd draw the fire one way and somebody else would come in another way. Close contact to them, as close as you could. And you had to worm your way up to it. The rifle and weapons platoons, 36 men each, were called Alpha Bravo teams. Throughout the war, it was these men who would carry the ultimate burden of closing with and destroying the enemy. The rifle has long been the traditional weapon of the infantrymen. The adoption of fire and maneuver tactics induced a transition from bolt action to semi-automatic rifles. Although the M1 Garand would become the standard rifle of the U.S. Army during the war, initially they were in short supply. Thousands of older model rifles remained in use, such as the U.S. rifle caliber 30 M1903 commonly known as the Springfield. The design was licensed from the Mauser Company of Germany after the Spanish-American War for approximately $200,000. This is a 1903 Springfield, which was the standard U.S. Army rifle in the interwar years. Uh, the Springfield is a 
bolt action, turn bolt operated, magazine fed, infantry rifle, has about a 26 inch barrel. The sights on this rifle were, were horrible. It has a little notch rear sight. For long range work, the sight's raised. It's adjusted by turning this screw and moving it up and down. There's, a, there's an aperture for that work. It's fine for range work on, and, and pre precision shooting on the range. But in combat, your targets are very fast moving, and you have to be to, able to very quickly acquire them, take aim, and then shoot. Because of the shortage of combat rifles early in the war, production of the Model 1903, or 03 as it was called, was reactivated. When the Marines landed on Guadalcanal in 1942, most were armed with Springfields. Nearly two years later, on June 6, 1944, Spec 5 Harry Davis stormed ashore at Normandy with the 5th Ranger Infantry Battalion. As a Ranger, Davis had been trained to use every type of small arm found in the European theater. But he had a particular fondness for the O3A4. I was the company commander's bodyguard and company sniper. Uh, wherever he went, I went. The O3 was a sniper weapon that I used to hit targets that were far away and with precision. And uh, they were very, very accurate guns. It's more accurate uh, because of a rigid construction. There is no moving parts when the gun is fired other than the firing pin. The 1903A4 was equipped with a telescopic sight, was issued primarily to snipers for very accurate fire at 800 to 1,000 yards. Harry Davis once employed his sniper skills to deal with German harassment from across no man's land. It was a gully between this and that, maybe about 200 yards. Uh, and there was a well there. And when we went to the well, it creaked. And every time somebody went to the well to get water, this German would fire on it and hit somebody. And I made my mind up I was going to get the guy that's doing it. I'll repay them back. I laid there for about four or five hours, and I saw somebody come out with a white shirt, a T-shirt, and hang his clothes on a line, a white shirt, or a white T-shirt again. And I laid there, and I zeroed in with my 03 rifle. And I measured it and measured it and measured it, and lo and behold, he came out to get his shirt off the line, and I fired. We didn't have any problems with the well anymore. The Springfield remained in service as a sniper weapon throughout the war. But the next generation infantry rifle was already in production. In 1937, after a decade of development, the U.S. Army had officially accepted the gas-operated semi-automatic caliber 30 M1, designed by John Garand. John Cantius Garand was a, actually Canadian. He was a classic, what the British would refer to as eccentric. He kept an ice skating rink in the living room of his home and would go ice skate in, in his house. But the man was a genius.